That song was written by Curtis Mayfield with the Impressions in the 1950s, and it is listed in the top ten greatest songs of the Civil Rights Movement. And uh, I don't know if you ever even heard it before. I was talking to a couple of guys, oh yeah, people get ready. I was talking to a couple of people, I'm going to have people get ready, play the operator. Never heard that song. You never heard people get ready? Come on, there's a train coming. You know, it's, it's a great song of hope. And uh, this week, typically I'm studying through the Gospel of the Book of Mark, but this week, things have just been kind of crazy in our world. And I don't know if you know, Spokane's been making the news. Right? And uh, I thought, you know, maybe we ought to just pause our regular stride of service and uh, start praying for things that are going on in our nation, the culture that we have find ourselves caught up in. And when I first saw this uh, woman who was elected last January as a NAACP local chapter president, you know what I thought? Honestly, I said, oh, cool. America's progressive. They elected a white girl to be in charge of the NAACP. That before, right? Boy, did I feel stupid later. And then did I feel not so stupid recently. In fact, I felt like the smartest person in Spokane for a while. I'm like, huh, I didn't want to say I told you so, but, you know, it wasn't obvious. I don't know. And uh, boy, has, has this brought us into the light in the news. But more than that, it's also brought issues of who are we as a people and who are we as a nation and how are we getting along at this time? What's, what's going on with us? Wednesday night in Charleston, South Carolina, 21-year-old Dylan Roof walked into a Bible study and he shot and killed nine people at the African uh, Manual African Methodist Episcopal Church. And his intent was to start a race riot and create a civil war. This incident occurred actually only a few miles, six miles away from uh, an event that happened in April where a police officer shot and killed an African-American man who was running away. And uh, Officer Slager's now been charged with murder over that. It was over a traffic stop, and evidently, for a malfunctioning brake light. Many people in our country have thought that, well, we've made these huge progressive strides towards racial harmony and reconciliation and all all those things, but I think we've watched over the last many months where we feel like something's wrong. Maybe the nation's being more torn apart than we realize. Maybe we haven't come as far as we thought. Or maybe some of us were naive. Maybe some of us thought we'd come a long way and others of us knew we never really had. It was all a fake. It's interesting because in a recent CBS New York uh, Times poll, 61% said race relations in this country are bad. In fact, that's the highest rating saying they're bad since 23 years ago when the Rodney King riots were going on. In in the time of our Civil War, white people rose up because they hated the institution of slavery. They wanted to abolish slavery, but across the boards, they honestly didn't care about civil rights. They didn't want slavery, but they didn't care about civil rights. And in the 1950s and the 1960s, they sought to end segregation and Jim Crow laws, and they rose up for civil rights, but Honestly, little work was done towards racial reconciliation and racial harmony. It seems like every so often in our history, a work of racial peace is left to a new generation. And in this day, in our time, more particularly probably in the time of you millennials, the work that's in front of you to do is the work of racial harmony, the work of reconciliation between the races, of bringing true peace and true understanding. Some of the ways we begin to approach the topic, and it's a dicey one, it's a tough one, but really we probably begin with just prayer. Typically, if you haven't been to our church, what we'll do is a lot of worship up front and then announcements, and then we have kind of a longer message. But today, we're going to break it up a little bit. We're going to do some scripture reading. We're going to do a little sermon now, a little sermon later, and sort of talk through this stuff because maybe we begin with prayer. And the right prayer for a time like this in a season like this with, with what is going on in America is prayers of lament, prayers of standing in the gap before God and saying, hey God, we need to have this cultural apology. And it's something actually that is biblical. You see Jeremiah do it in the book of Lamentations. You see Ezra do it. You see Nehemiah do it. It's men who are righteous. In this case, these guys who are talking, these righteous men rise up and they do this prayer of repentance and apology. And in truth, they weren't wrong. They weren't the bad guys. It's not like they could say, well, I didn't do anything wrong, so I'm not going to pray for it. That's someone else's job to do. They're the sinner. They're the ones who need to be praying it. There are times when the righteous need to rise up and intercede with God and say, God, something's wrong as an entire society, and we need to own that something's wrong, and we need to repent to you that this is not righteousness on the earth. This is not what you set up. This is not what you wanted amongst peoples. You didn't want this hatred. You didn't want this violence. You didn't want oppression. You didn't want sickness and disease. You didn't want abject poverty. You did not want injustice. And we've talked tolerated it, and we've lived with it. And whether we have been personally directly involved or not, sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes we stand in the gap and we say the prayer 
Nehemiah, an incredibly righteous man who had done no wrong. He's a righteous guy who was bringing a group of people back from Babylon to a destroyed Jerusalem. And Jerusalem had been destroyed at the word of God, at the hand of God, and with the knowledge of God. They'd been warned and warned and warned. And God said, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. You're messing up. You're turning your back on me. And judgment will become. And they basically said, who cares? And God had to send the Babylonians in to destroy his beloved people so that they would finally turn back to him. If the only thing you'll listen to is destruction, God says, that's what I'll give you. I'll give you hundreds of warnings first, but that's all you'll listen to. That's what you'll get. Because turning you back from wickedness is more important to me. So Nehemiah is bringing people back 70 years later after there's been this destruction. And uh, he says this in chapter one, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, and then even if you ex- exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as the dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servants success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Before me, seven years before me, I need to stand in the gap and repent of that. So here's what we're going to do today. I've got three different lament prayers. They're back there on that counter. There's about 30 of them. This particular lament says this. It says, let us ask God to forgive us. Almighty God, you love us, but we have not loved you as we ought. You call, but we have not listened. We walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped up in our own concerns. We've gone along with evil, with prejudice, with warfare, greed. God, our Father, help us to face up to ourselves so that as you move toward us in mercy, we may repent and turn to you and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So here's what we're going to do over the next 15 minutes, maybe 20. Have some scriptures read. We'll sing a song. Scriptures read. We'll sing a song. It's going to be free movement. Over here, you see those whiteboards. Those are our prayer wall. We just flipped them around. All the prayers that were on it uh, have been changed out. So there's a prayer wall. You can go over there and write. Start writing some prayers down there. Just just like a little note to God. What would you like to see God do? Maybe in your life. Maybe in the life of a friend. Maybe in the healing of our nation. Back at the counter, there's art to reflect on. There's three different laments. Grab a lament. Walk around. Just pray it. Just pace. Walk around. Or sit at your seat and pray it, or get on your knees and pray it. Whatever fits, whatever makes you connect with God. And pray it on behalf of the fact that we need God to start moving in our nation in a huge way because something's wrong. Something's terribly wrong. Communion will be served where Bill is. You can line up and take communion. The whole idea here is it's sort of a moment when we don't put on a show for you, but you find God. Not when we do a, here, just sit back and watch us do everything, and we'll do it for you. We'll pray for you. We'll sing for you. We'll do it all. We don't want to do that here. What we want to do in our churches, we're all collectively gathered to meet and encounter God. And if we don't do it in individually. It's like if you don't experience God individually, then the whole thing's a waste of time. You need to hear God. You need to have God speak to you in your life. You need to have your own prayers. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, oh no, God doesn't listen to me. I'm a terrible sinner. And I would say, hey, you know, we're all sitting in the room as a messed up sinner. And all of us got issues like when we come to God, we say, hey Lord, this is my starting point. And he always says, I'll take where you are. Wherever your starting point is, it's cool. And I think there's times when no matter what's going on in your personal life, it can be like, you know what? I can still intercede on behalf of a nation that needs healing, of, of racial harmony that is broken right now. I can intercede on that. I can intercede on injustice and I can intercede on poverty and I can intercede on oppression. I can start asking God's kingdom to start moving in places in America where it's desperately needed because it's not my power, but it's God's. So over the next 15 minutes, we'll read some scriptures. We'll sing, grab a lament, hit the prayer wall, take communion, sing with us, sit at your seat and sing. But this is kind of what you can do. The only kind of, I guess we'd call it the rule that we have is just don't disturb the worship of the people around you. All right, let them have their space too, okay? It was uh, probably late 1990s. I had this friend who was a black Pentecostal guy who had uh, left Cincinnati where he'd been in Church of God in Christ and uh, grown up in black neighborhoods his whole life, done black church, came out to California and, you know, through a series of crazy events, he was leading worship at a virtually all-white church of 2,000 people. And... uh, 
he would become Uncle Ron to my children, right? He would just be tremendous influence in our lives. He would be one of the closest friends I would ever make. And I remember one night, uh, we, he would come over to the house all the time because we were his family. And uh, my kids were like his connection to family. His mom and dad had died. He was an only child. And, you know, his cousins and everything were far away. And one night, we're sitting home and he's watching TV. And, you know, the movie's not quite over yet. And he's like, oh, I'm just going to go home. I'm like, Ron, come on, man. The movie's not even over. Hang out with us. He goes, nah, nah, I need to get going. I need to get going. I'm like, wait till, at least wait till the movie ends. Nah, it's getting laid out, and I, I just need to go home. And I said, come on, man. You just need to sit with us. And he kind of turns to me and says, Rob, I just, I just don't feel like getting pulled over tonight. So what do you mean? Well, I'm a black guy. I'm in Pleasanton, California, suburbs of San Francisco Bay Area. I get pulled over all the time. If I go out late at night, I'm, you know what, I get in the car now, and I drive home to my apartment, which is on the other side of town, chances of me getting pulled over are about 90%. And it happens all the time. I just don't feel like dealing with it tonight. And it dawned on me for the first time, here's Ron and I, we're both working in the same church, same social status, same economic opportunity, same um, neighborhoods. You know, I had a little house and he had an apartment and we made about the same salary, worked in the same church and lived in the same town. Everything was the same, same, same. And you know what? Never once in my entire life did it ever once flit across my mind, I think I'll get pulled over tonight because I'm driving past 10 o'clock. Never came across my mind, but it came across his mind all the time. That was the first awakening I experienced where I said, I realized that we don't live in the same America. We really don't live in the same America, do we? The America he lives in, in the same town, same place, same neighborhood, working at the same church, is different than the America I live in. Because what he has to think about, I never think about. I think about if I got pulled over, I must have a brake light out or I was probably speeding. But he knows I'll get pulled over just because I'm driving while black in Pleasanton. California. And I began to see this idea that something's, something's amiss. And so listening to more stories, and I began to say, well, tell me about your experiences and being introduced to other people and kind of finding out some different things. And it was an interesting uh, series of years. I began reading some different books and looking at some different and stuff that had happened. Once I was actually in Colorado, and I was at a retreat, a personal retreat with a guy named Pete Richardson, and he does sort of, he'll take you for three days or four days of your life and help you chart a life course of what you should be, where you've been, what you are, where you think you should go. It's sort of a personal life mission planning thing. It costs about three grand, and the church I was working for at the time paid for me to go, go to this thing, spend three days with this guy. He was a top guy in the Promise Keepers movement. He was one of the first five in Promise Keepers. And so when a football coach was sitting around talking about, hey, let's do this thing, he was really early on the ground floor, and he rode that promise keeper's wave as a deep, deep insider the whole duration of the time. And uh, so he was, you know, 60,000 people in a stadium, guys gathering together here in worship, worshiping together. They just started working on just who you are as a man and that kind of stuff. And he said, you know, after several years of doing it, we really felt compo- compelled that we needed to shift gears and start discussing racial harmony. And so the last few years of the Promise Keepers movement was devoted to racial harmony and racial reconciliation. And he said to me in this private meeting, sitting on a couch in his office in Colorado, he said, we never got so many death threats as when we changed our message to one of racial reconciliation and harmony. We got hate mail like you couldn't believe from the Christian community across America. And we got death threats that were unbelievable. Eventually, the weight and the pressure and the way it tore us apart and some other things that happened, we just sort of the whole organization crumbled. And it's like, well, you weren't getting death threats from the secular community. Who were the death threats coming from? It was the church people. They were going to—they were threatening to bomb you for preaching racial reconciliation in the 1990s and around the early 2000s. Yeah, I'm like, wow. You know, America's not what I thought it was. And I began to go to denominational meetings. One of the things I liked about the Evangelical Covenant, I was ordained in a Baptist general conference, and I would go to their meetings, and it would be a bunch of old blue guys in brown and blue suits and gray suits sitting around at tables, right? And I'm like, oh, I just don't fit these suit and tie guys, you know, these old geezers. And uh, so I started shopping for a denomination. I love the Evangelical Covenant. And I went to the Covenant. One of my first experiences with them was a midwinter conference back in a hotel in Chicago, and 2,000 people are filled in this room, and there's Asians up there on the stage, and there's African Americans, and there's a bunch of Latinos, and a bunch of whites mixed in, and everybody's kind of worshiping together, and they'll read a creed in Korean, and they'll read the Apostles' Creed in Spanish, they'll sing a song in Spanish, and, and um, all the, the African Americans in the crowd are amen in the sermons, amen and amen, and different. I'm like, I like this, I like this, different, everybody's in it together, and you know, everybody kind of had their own, their African American churches were hardcore African American when you went to them, they were, you know, 
came in and in Pentecostal style, and then there was others that were, uh, the Spanish churches were iglesias. They weren't, you know, just, hey, we're just a bunch of Spanish people doing white folks' church. But they were iglesias, and the, the Korean church, we, I went to one big church that was multi-ethnic down in, uh, one of our sister churches is down in Irvine, California. It's called New Song. About five or 6,000 people go to that church, and I went to it one time to check it out because it was one of the biggest multicultural churches around, and I walked in. It's like like 90% Asian and like maybe 10% Hispanic and white, and I talked to one of the pastors on staff, and I said, I, I thought you guys said you were like multicultural, but you, you kind of look the same to me. And he goes, oh, no, we're multicultural. We're, we're Chinese and Korean, <laughs> right? Now, listen, to us white folk, we're like, are you kidding me, right? But that just began to show how little we know. Chinese and Korean were two totally different cultures, two totally different mindsets, two totally different nations, right? It would be uh, like in the early days of America, saying, well, all you white folks are like, so you, you know, you French people are meeting with the Norwegians. It's all the same. It's like, oh, they would have said, oh, no. It's a, our thing was, it's like the multicultural churches, about half Chinese and about half Korean and it's mixed in with some white folk. And it's like, that's a multicultural church. And I'm like, because a white guy would have said, no, it's not. And I had to learn. I had to learn. Oh, yes, it is. You don't know enough. You're, you're stuck in your own white bread culture, Rob. You don't understand what's going on. And I began to read and, and see more stuff that was going on. And I started picking up books. And, and, I, and I read this one, Linking Arms, Linking Lives, when I was downtown and started reading. It's just a Ron Sider, John Perkins, maybe you know him, famous civil rights leader, Wayne Gordon, and a guy named Albert Tizan. And these guys had written this book. And it was phenomenal about urban and suburban churches and what's the difference. And when suburban churches want to help urban ones, 10 things to do and 10 things not to do. And in the urban church to say the same thing. If you're going to work with a suburban church, here's 10 things to do, 10 things not to do. Great stuff about race and about poverty and about the cultures of different places in America. And they wrote this mostly out of Chicago. And this fourth writer, Albert Tizan, recently got elected to the head of the Evangelical Covenant's National Oversight of Glo Serve Globally. And he was in town about a month ago and he sat right over there in that corner for about two days. We had a chance to talk with him. Fascinating guy. Great book. I started reading this and understanding, oh, it's very, very different. And then um, this one by Soon Cha Chan Ra, he's an evangelical covenant pastor, Cambridge, um, planted a church in Cambridge, Massachusetts, graduate of Harvard University. Now he works at North Park working on racial diversity and racial reconciliation in the evangelical churches in America. He's a big name for it. And I remember sitting and listening to him talk one time, and he did a whole sermon on, he was reading article after article after article about how the New England states were dead. Christianity's dead in New England and places like Boston and Cambridge, it's over. The churches are empty and, and God is done with those places. And it's like nobody goes to church anymore. And he was a church planter in Cambridge. So he did this sermon where he did a whole study. And he says, I'll tell you what, you look in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you start studying. And he says, more people attend church in Cambridge, Massachusetts today per capita than at any time in the history of the United States of America. And he says, well, you know what the difference is? All the white churches are dead and empty. It's Spanish churches and Asian churches. There are more people attending church in the spiritually dead Cambridge, Massachusetts today, alive and vibrant, but see, they're not white people. And he goes, well, what's going on? He says, only the white voices are the ones speaking at the conferences, looking at the white churches and saying Christianity is dead. He says, I'm getting sick and tired of going to all these conferences of people telling us how to do it when it's, you know, some perpetual 29-year-old in a goatee with a shaved head is telling us how to do church. And uh, let me tell you, he's edgy. <laughs> <laughs> but fascinating guy. And one book that started to shape some of my thinking was Divided by Faith, Evangelical Religion and the Problem of Race in America. And these two authors, Michael Emerson and uh, Christian Smith, did an in-depth study on what has gone on in race in America and what has happened here and why, why, is, it the ways, why is the church sort of failed to respond and, and what is the issues that we need to, to raise up? And in, in a nutshell, some of their, they had a lot of great arguments, um, but one of their premises is that because here, white people's solution to racism, and he mentions promise keeping, was white guys need to make black friends and black guys need to make white friends. And if you do that, racial harmony will come to pass. Because what's happened is white people have failed to realize there's institutional racism in America. We're like, I don't even know what you're talking about when you say that. What do you mean institutional racism? Well, let me give you an example. For the longest time, banks would not loan money to anybody inside certain neighborhoods. And they redlined them. There's a map of a town or a city and they would do a red line around that neighborhood and say, I don't care how good your job is. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care. You're in that neighborhood. We don't loan money to you because that's a high-risk neighborhood. You're a poverty neighborhood. And so what would happen is African-American people with a good job couldn't get a home loan. African-American people with a good job couldn't get a car loan. They couldn't get a car loan. They couldn't buy the car. They couldn't keep the job. And so you had this experience where the actual banks were perpetuating poverty and keeping people down. It's one, and you know what? You can One black guy can make friends with a white guy as much as you want, and it wasn't going to change that situation. And it's illegal, but banks were doing it all the time. In the 1990s, a huge uh, drug came on the scene called crack cocaine. Crack is 
actually cheap cocaine. Uh, real cocaine is way more expensive, way more pure. Crack is a mixed down uh, blend of some other things, and it's much more intense in some of its effects, but it's actually a cheap, cheap cocaine. And yet, when it hit the market, you know, it, the news got a hold of it, and they blam blasted how bad crack cocaine was, and everybody got up in arms. And in the 1990s, officials got elected by being tough on crime. You want to get elected, you better be tough on crime. You will get elected to any position in a city or in a state government if you are tough on crime. And what does tough on crime actually mean? What does that translate to? Well, if you're a politician, tough on crime translates to higher sentences, less parole. That's all you can really do as a politician. You know, I mean, don't you can outlaw a few new things, but tough on crime meant if you break the law, we're going to throw the book at you. We're going to give you from a two-year two sentence to a five-year sentence. And we're going to say if you could get paroled in three years, now you can't be paroled for four years. We're going to make it tough on crime meant we need to keep people in jail longer. And the drug of choice at that time was crack cocaine, and you had regular cocaine. And so they went after crack cocaine because the media was saying how bad crack was, even though it was a dumbed-down version of real cocaine. Now, in society, who could buy pure cocaine? White folk. Rich white folk in the suburbs are buying real cocaine. Who's buying crack cocaine? Poor folk in the ghettos the drug they could afford. So the white guy gets arrested with a higher, pure form of cocaine. He gets a two-year sentence. The black guy with crack cocaine, same exact amount. He gets arrested. He gets a five- or six-year sentence, right? That's institutional racism. It's built into the structure of the system. And there's nothing a guy can do about it. It's like, we've built into the system these ways to keep the poor folk even poorer, to keep the folks down who are already down. We built it into the system to give some favoritism, even though it really isn't favoritism. I think it's normal. For me, Personally, I just let you know, I hate the term white privilege because to me it's like it's not a privilege, it's whether it should be for everybody. A, a privilege is something you get above and beyond what's expected. No, whatever get whatever white people get, it should be for everybody. It drives me nuts. We should raise stuff up. But here's the society we live in. Here's what's going on. And it's sort of until we as a white culture begin to embrace that we live in a different America than people who are African American or often Hispanic, or sometimes what happens in the Asian populations. We actually experience a different America in our day-to-day -day living. Within the evangelical country. Covenant. Oh, the last book I want to mention was a social justice handbook, Small Steps for a Better World. And it's like, you want to get involved, you care, you want to do something, here's a how to do something book, right? How to start looking at what you can do from wherever you're at in America and starting all over and beginning again and uh, see, see what can happen. In Sun Run Cha's book, Many Colors, he quotes Dr. Martin Luther King's letter, uh, letter from a Birmingham jail. And it's worth repeating. Martin Luther King said, I have been so greatly disappointed with the white church and its leadership. I did not say this as one of those negative critics who can always find something wrong with the church. I say this as a minister of the gospel who loves the church. When I was suddenly catapulted into the leadership of the bus protest in Montgomery, Alabama a few years ago, I felt we would be supported by the white church. I felt that the ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South would be among our strongest allies. Instead, some have been outright opponents, refusing to understand the freedom movement and misrepresenting its leaders. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the unnecessary sizing security of stained glass windows. In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white churchmen stand on the sideline and mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I have heard many ministers say, those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. And I have watched many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion, which makes a strange, unbiblical distinction between body and soul between the sacred and the secular. There was a time when the church was very powerful, in a time when the early church rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of people's opinions. It was a thermostat that transformed the morals of society. Quite an indictment. I began looking at different things that we could engage in. Our denomination, which is historically Swedish, a Swedish it began in the Swedish roots, actually uh, stayed Swedish. I think actually First Covenant Church was still doing hymn sings in Swedish in the 60s, the 1960s. So it was like, this is a Swedish group. And in the 1950s and 60s, as a group, they came together and they said, we will die if we stay an ethnic white church. We must go after change. And they began to aggressively go after seeking Asian and Hispanic and, and uh, Latino churches and uh, African-American churches. And it's kind of weird because when I first joined, I had to sit down and say, so you guys, you're not all the same, right? You have Evangelical Covenant Church, are different. I mean, so, so on one side of town is an African-American pastor who does the full three-hour church service with the uh, hankies and everything and people laying out on the floor 
floor, and then his neighbor across the church is a white guy in a high Lutheran church where he wears the robes, and he has the incense, and he wears the stole, and they're both evangelical covenant churches, and they're like, yeah, I'm like, well, how do they unite together? Well, they unite over theology, and they have to agree not to fight with each other, right? I'm like, oh, I think that's kind of cool, actually. So you start learning when you're sitting at the table, and I'd begin sitting at the table with these guys. I'd go to conferences. I'd sit at the table with inner city white or uh, black pastors and guys out of Oakland. I'd talk to one guy over at a conference down in uh, California about two years ago. We talked to these guys who do inner city Oakland church, and a common thing for them is to meet in their coffee shop and plan church services, and when gunfire goes off, they hit the deck. And then when the gunfire is over, they get back up and keep planning their church service. He says, the police don't even come into our neighborhood. We don't have any problems with police. We never see police ever, you know? And it's like, wow, I thought I had it tough. I thought my neighborhood downtown was tough. And they've all kind of said the same thing. We want racial harmony. We want racial reconciliation. We want to to have our voices heard and have our stories heard. And and it will never happen if the white people won't sit at table. And in general, that's the fundamental problem. The whites won't sit at table and let us tell our story. And it's like, wow, okay, well, let's sit down. The other thing would happen in the movement of the evangelical covenant churches, sometimes a position would open up. And we, you know, I sat with a bunch of guys my age, pastors, who said, you know, you spend your time working through the ranks and becoming a pastor and growing in churches, and sometimes a position will open up in the denomination where you could get a chance to become something over a large area of, of uh, churches, a superintendent or assistant superintendent or the director of church planning or something like that. And I remember sitting in some meetings, sitting down with a bunch of guys who'd been in the denomination for a long time. We all said, you know what needs to happen for our generation? When the time comes for those positions to open, we should not apply. We all got to stop our career path moving up those ranks, and we have to get allow those positions to open up to African American men and women, and to Asian and to Latino and to in, uh, Native people. But we have to stop, and we have to basically say, you know, no whites need apply, and we say that to ourselves. And we began to do that, and over and over, we started to see uh, Ephraim Smith, phenomenal voice in the African American community nationwide, as a pastor, become a superintendent of the Pacific Southwest Conference. And Greg Yi, Chinese Hawaiian, who's the superintendent of the Pacific North. Northwest Conference, begin to see a bunch of different faces rise up who have, can bring a different voice, who can bring a different flavor. And as part of the work of racial harmony and reconciliation for several years, this conference, which is Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Washington, has gotten together and done a journey to mosaic exercise every November. And the idea of that is you get together with someone of a different ethnicity and you go on a four-day bus ride together. And the bus ride you have, you see videos and you read some articles and you that sort of, do that sort of thing and you stay in hotels, but you will stop along the way starting in northern Idaho, you will go to the internment camps where the Japanese were interned during World War II. And someone who grew up in there or whose family was interned there will, at that site, speak to you about what it meant to their family and how they tried to repair from that those years. What happened to the losses, how their homes were taken, everything they owned was gone. They had great jobs, great businesses, and just one day they were put in a camp and it was all over and they couldn't get back. They were, weren't repaid for it and just how that affected the next three generations of family. And then you go to the Native American reservations and you talk to some of the people there who were um, talk about their Christian experience from a Native American's perspective. And for a while, Lenore Three Stars was on the board of this church. She does that talk. And then you go to the migrant farm workers fields and there's Latino men and women who will tell you what it's like to come across to America and try to find a job and work there and what it feels like and how what their experiences are and what they're really trying for. And then they go down to the Vancouver, Portland area and there's a discussion with the uh, Polynesian um, people, the tribal peoples from places like Hawaii and what their experience was coming over and then up to Seattle and Chinatown and some of the deep African-American churches. And it's a four-day bus ride talking about racial harmony and racial reconciliation. And everybody in it is like, we're all coming to this because we're united in Jesus Christ. And we think Jesus wants to do something different. They've recently built something even better in the denomination. There's a three-week thing. If you're 18 to 25 years old, you can go down to inner city Oakland. and They have a, a mosaic program down there where you spend three weeks living in a house in inner city Oakland, traveling and seeing what all these what all of these different ministries are doing. I talked to pastors who are black pastors down in Oakland. And you know what their biggest goal was? We need to start a credit union. We need to get a credit union in our church. Well, why do you need a credit union? Because none of our people have ever a chance of getting a car loan. None of our people are ever going to have the opportunities. That, so if we can start a credit union, our church can boom. And they're buying whole, you know, apartment complexes and transforming them from drug houses and slums to, we're going to have these apartment complexes that we work with getting people out of poverty, huge stuff. And at the national level, there's one called the Journey to Sankofa, which is a traveling throughout the Deep South and going to the old plantations where the slaves were kept and talking to people who are direct descendants from slaves who were held in those plantations. 
and say, what's it like? What happened to your family after slavery was abolished? Tell us the story of your family. And until we start hearing the stories of one another, we don't understand that we live in a different America. And what Jesus wants to do in the next generation is to deal with harmony and peace and healing the wounds that have happened in the past. Slavery didn't care about civil rights. They just wanted to abolish slavery. The civil rights movement didn't care about harmonizing the races. They just didn't want segregation. It's falling to this era and this generation to talk about we've got to figure out a way to bring peace, harmony. And uh, when Martin Luther King was shot and killed on that night on April 4th, the next day, Robert Kennedy in Indianapolis, Indiana, had to announce that news to the constituents who'd gathered, and he had to tell them this news that the world had changed. When Martin Luther King was assassinated. There was something huge in that change. And I have a video clip of this because I think the words that he says are like the words for us in our generation. Like, yes, this is what we need to hear. It's our turn now to take these words of inspiration and wisdom and figure out a way that we in our era and our time, even in mostly white Spokane, can figure out a way to bring harmony and peace. I'm working with a couple of African-American pastors right now about doing a, a gospel choir sing-off here in the fall in this venue because it's like if we don't start mixing with each other, it ain't going to happen. Um, but I want you to listen to these words. And when we end it, I'm going to follow up with like, probably the single greatest freedom hymn that was ever written. And it's not the kind of service where you're going to walk out and go, okay, I know what to do. The kind of service where it's like, I need to begin studying. I need to begin listening. I need to begin reading. I need to know more about myself, what Jesus wants to do, because it's falling to us to heal the wounds of racial injustice, oppression. That's falling to our generation. That's our time. And I don't know, God may call up some of you to do something profound and powerful. Um, and I think in all of us, God's going to say, but whatever, don't sit on the sideline. Find a way. Be involved. Watch this video.